What can we learn by reflecting on the ancient warrior cultures of Greece, Rome, and Israel? Why were most ancient cultures warrior cultures? Who served in the military in the ancient world? Was slavery and seas and concubines an integral part of a warrior culture? Were women slaves subject to sexual abuse? Why was Homer's Iliad and Odyssey so key to understanding ancient Greek culture? And how do these ancient warrior cultures differ from our modern world? Please, we welcome interesting questions in the comments. Let us learn and reflect together. At the end of our talk, we'll discuss the sources used for this video. Please feel free to follow along in the PowerPoint script we uploaded to SlideShare. Ancient societies were warrior societies. They had no choice. All citizens had to fight for the city in time of war. There were no conscientious objectors in the ancient world. The ancients would have found the concept absurd. Battles between neighboring cities could be somewhat ritualized, with the winner negotiating terms of the losing side, but if the battle were more brutal, all the men on the losing side could be slaughtered, and all the women and children could be enslaved, or sometimes they were also slaughtered. You cannot understand the culture of ancient Greece and Rome, nor can you understand the culture of the Old Testament, until you realize that these were warrior cultures out of necessity. Most of the cruel stories and hard sayings of the Old Testament are easier to interpret if you understand the warrior culture of the ancient world, which was first expressed in Homer's Iliad and Odyssey. The Roman armies enslaved many cities and tribes they conquered, although maybe they could show leniency towards cities who opened their gates to their armies, or maybe not. Warfare accounted for most of the slaves in the ancient world. In Athens, an estimated one in four people were slaves, and in Rome, the portion of slaves was much higher. War was part of life. We read in the Old Testament how King David was tempted by the sight of Bathsheba bathing on a roof when he let his general go to battle, for it was spring after harvest the time when all kings go to war. And we also read how Socrates served in the Athenian hoplite infantry in the Peloponnesian War. All noblemen bought the weapons and armor and helmet and shield to serve as a hoplite, and most freemen without landed property served as rowers in the Athenian triple-decked fleet of trireme warships. First we'll discuss the warrior society of ancient Greece. The Greeks were the most formidable fighting force in the Near East. In the first Greco-Persian War, the mighty Persian Empire loaded their army on ships to fight what they thought would be an easy victory at the Battle of Marathon, but they were decisively defeated by the Athenian hoplites, who were outnumbered. And later, Athens and Sparta and their allies, both on land and sea, also achieved astounding feats against the Persians. And we included in our discussion on Herodotus a description of both hoplite infantry combat as well as naval trireme combat. The playwright Aeschylus has an eyewitness account of the naval battle of Salamis where the Greeks, led by the Athenian triremes, decisively ram and defeat the Persian fleet. This established the reputation of the Greeks as the most formidable warriors of the ancient world. Later, a Persian prince, Cyrus the Younger, hired a Greek hoplite infantry army to grab the crown of Persia from his brother, King Artaxerxes. The Greeks dominated the battle, but Cyrus was killed in the fighting losing first their patron, then many generals through Persian perfidy. Xenophon was elected to lead the 10,000 Greek army as they fought their way through the Persian Empire to the Greek colonies on the shores of the Black Sea. At the end of their adventures, most continued to fight the Persians under a Spartan commander, and a few others, including Xenophon, returned to Greece. This demonstrated that the mighty Persian Empire was vulnerable. Later, Alexander the Great of Macedon would conquer all of Persia and some of India also. When reflecting on the Iliad and the Odyssey, I was struck by the similarities between the stories of the Iliad and the stories of Indian courage and stoic fortitude when facing life's struggles, when facing your enemy, and when risking all to argue for the life of your loved ones in the camp of the enemy. There were several camp-meeting stories in both the Iliad and the Tales of the Northwest, which is a collection of Indian stories. In the Iliad, in addition to the priest Chrysus boldly walking into the Greek camp to ask for the return of his daughter Chryseis, King Priam of Troy later boldly walked into the tent of Achilles in the heart of the Greek camp to ask for the body of his son Hector, so he could give him a proper burial. In the Tales of the Northwest, the half-breed Charles Hess boldly walked into the hostile Indian camp, past the scalps of his wife and sons, to ask for the return of his only daughter. In these camp-meeting stories, warriors respected the personal courage of the supplicants, 
and often the supplicant shared a meal with their enemy before departing with their loved one. And another example of a successful camp meeting story was when later, after the fall of the Roman Empire, the courageous unarmed Pope Leo the Great met with Attila the Hun in his camp, persuading him not to sack Rome. Now, the Greeks may have been the founders of Western civilization, but they were first and foremost a warrior society. If the Greeks weren't formidable warriors, they would have been conquered by the mighty Persian Empire, which meant that there would have been no Socrates, no Plato, no Xenophon. The Greeks would not have been able to leave us a cultural legacy. Some of the Greeks yearning for battle were satisfied by the ancient Olympic Games, open only to Greek cities. Most of the Olympic competitions were competitions by warriors. It was not unusual for contestants to perish during their Olympic competitions. And in the Iliad, the Greek heroes chose to fight for ten long years for the honor of King Menelaus, whose wife Helen was kidnapped by Paris, Prince of Troy. The mighty men of Troy f chose to fight to the end, though they knew their fight was futile, though they knew that in the end Troy would be sacked and their women and children would be enslaved in distant Greece. The wife of Hector of Troy begs her husband Hector not to return to the battle, not to make her son an orphan, not to make her a widow. But Hector answers her in the Iliad, I would die of shame to face the men of Troy, and the Trojan women trailing their long robes, if I would shrink from battle now, a coward. Nor does the spirit urge me on that way. I have learned it all too well, to stand up bravely, to always to fight in the front ranks of Trojan soldiers, winning my father great glory, and glory for myself. For in my heart and soul I know this well. The day will come when sacred Troy must die. King Priam must die and all his people with him. Priam who hurls the strong ash spear. And another section in the Iliad expounds the stoic fatalism of the Greeks. There are two great jars that stand on the floor of Zeus's halls and hold his gifts. Our miseries won, now good times in turn. When Zeus, who loves the lightning, mixes gifts for a man, now he meets with misfortune, and now good times in turn. When Zeus dispenses gift from the jar of sorrow only, he makes a man an outcast. Brutal ravenous hunger drives him down the face of the shining earth stalking far and wide, cursed by gods and men. And there's a modern criticism that the ancient Greeks had an oppressive patriarchal society. And you fall short of that mark, for the Greeks and indeed the Romans and all other long-lived ancient cultures were not merely patriarchal, they are instead downright brutal, true warrior societies. And if you have any doubts, consider the main theme of the Iliad. The very first word is rage that is raging in the heart of Achilles. The rage Achilles feels towards King Agamemnon. During the years before the sack of Troy, the Greeks had been marauding the towns surrounding Troy, capturing many of the local women to serve as concubines. Briseis belonged to Achilles, while King Agamemnon had Chryseis, daughter of Chrysus. Now, Chrysus was a priest of Apollo who brought a plague to the Greeks when they refused to release his daughter, Chryseis. Angry that he was compelled to release a slave girl to halt the plague, Agamemnon then seized Achilles' girl, Briseis, reasoning. Briseis, Briseis, they both sound alike. What's the difference? Now, slaves and slavery and women forced to be concubines were part of the ancient warrior culture. The fear that one day your city-state would be defeated and your women and children would be sold into slavery was a fear that all classes of society faced. In one painting, after the defeat of Troy, we see the timid demeanor of the Trojan queen Andromache at a Greek slave auction. Should we define slavery only as chattel slavery where the slaves are the personal property of another? Should medieval serfs who are not chattel slaves and are permitted to marry and hold property be considered slaves? Although chattel slavery was addressed in the Torah, or Old Testament, and there is also many mentions in the Old Testament of servants where it was unclear whether they were chattel slaves, or really serfs, or perhaps servants who had nowhere else to go, and were often part of the family. What we do know is that although the systems of slavery varied by culture, there is always the problem that women slaves could be sexually abused since a master could do as he wished with his property, and since there was no policeman to call in the ancient world. Should black sharecroppers be considered serfs or effectively slaves? Are minimum wage employees who do not earn a living wage really slaves? Now the Bible doesn't mention this or that social system because the real question is, does our society treat laborers on the bottom rung of the social ladder fairly? Are all who work a 40 hour week entitled to a living wage where they can feed, clothe, and house their family with dignity? Should everyone live their life free from fear and free from want, as the four freedoms in the Atlantic Charter of FDR proclaim? And the fact is, is the Old Testament prophets, the Jewish rabbis, the Stoic philosophers, and the Christian apostles and church fathers over the centuries do exhort us to treat the poor and immigrants with fairness, ensuring that they can live with security and dignity. Now, why doesn't the Bible condemn slavery? 
Why don't we also ask, why doesn't the Bible condemn serfdom? Why doesn't the Bible condemn a minimum wage too low to feed your family with dignity? Now, modern scholars argue that the Iliad and Odyssey affected the Greek language and culture as profoundly as Shakespeare and the King James Bible affected the English language and culture. Some scholars even speculate that Greek literature and literacy was born when the Greeks sought to record these Homeric epics for posterity. What distinguishes the Greek culture from other later warrior cultures like of the American Indian several hundred years ago? Mainly literacy. And with literacy came the questioning of social values. When Homer celebrates the glory of war and the ancient Greek heroes, his hero Achilles also questions the futility of war, viewing Briseis not merely as a concubine, but as a sympathetic character who returns the affection of Achilles, who is willing to withdraw from combat, suffering possible humiliation, to force Agamemnon to return her to his arms. And many of these same things are echoed in the Odyssey. The misadventures of Odysseus and his decade-long journey home from the Trojan War begins when his tribe raids a coastal town, seeking plunder and capturing women as slaves, but they linger too long and are attacked by the men of all the surrounding towns. Which leads us to ask, were the ancient Greeks the Vikings of the ancient world? Were the ancient Greeks also pirates? Famously, Julius Caesar was captured by pirates who ransomed him so that he would not be sold into slavery. And the sitting philosopher Diogenes of Sinope, who famously lived in a pot in the marketplace of Athens, was captured by pirates and sold into slavery in Corinth. He refused to be ransomed and, like a good cynic philosopher, spent the rest of his life raising the sons of the Corinthian who purchased him. Likewise, the Odyssey begins with a romanticized account of Odysseus's trustworthy slave Eumaeus, who was a prince captured by pirates and sold into slavery. And the tables are turned on Odysseus when twice he is forced to be a sex slave both to the witch Circe and then to the nymph Calypso, helpless to leave for his beloved wife Penelope until the gods force Calypso to release him so he can continue his journey. Modern scholars wonder why he feels free to discuss these misadventures with his wife Penelope after he returns home. But this simply could indicate that those in the ancient world simply accepted that this sometimes is part of your fate. Another later example of women being captured in war is in the later Roman conflicts between the Visigoth Alaric and the Roman Republic. First, Alaric's wife and children were captured in his disputes with Rome. And then after that, he sacked Rome and he captured the emperor's sister, Gallipolicida. Now, as Alaric was previously a Roman general himself, this conflict was more of a civil war than a barbarian invasion. Shortly after her capture, she's briefly married to the Visigoth ruler, Atolf, until his premature death. Then she remarries back into the Roman and Byzantine ruling families. Now, during the tales of the misadventures in the Odyssey, the entire crew is lost to their hubris, and only Odysseus is left on the shore of his native Ithaca. This tale resembles a Clint Eastwood Western movie. Odysseus, his son Telemachus, and some loyal slaves face down and slaughter a hundred suitors seeking the hand of his wife who seek to confiscate his home and estates. Now, the Greeks did not look forward to a happy place when they crossed the river Styx after death. When the heroes of the Iliad descended into Hades, they were but mindless shades that flitted about forgetfully in the dark abyss below. When Odysseus calls up the souls of the underworld, he can only converse with the shades of the dead through an offering of blood to revive their memories. What survived the death of their heroes was their kleos, their honor, the memories of their valor displayed on the battlefield, their valiant deeds of war that would be sung by the bards to their children and grandchildren. We reflect on other aspects of ordinary life and justice in ancient Greece, Rome, and Israel. Ancient medicine, although surprisingly sophisticated, was nevertheless primitive compared to modern times. Aspirin was unknown. Many people died from fever. Infant mortality was sky high. Less than half of infants survived to adulthood, and many women died in childbirth. In this video, we reflected on how the stresses of battles and wars affected the cultures of ancient Greece, Rome, and Israel, including its effect on how slaves and women were treated. Next, we reflect on how warfare differed among these three cultures. Now we'll discuss the sources we used for this video. Reflecting on the Iliad and the Odyssey is essential if you want to understand Greek history and philosophy, and in my humble opinion, the Old Testament as well. Furthermore, since the Greco-Persian Wars and the Peloponnesian Wars are also important in understanding Greek culture, we recommend reflecting on the histories by the Greek historian Herodotus, Thucydides, Xenophon, and the Roman historian Plutarch. And in particular, several of the main Platonic dialogues draw from the history of the 30 tyrants installed in power and overthrown soon after the end of the Peloponnesian Wars. 
and we discuss the Greek and Roman historians in depth in our book reviews on Greek history and philosophy. The YouTube description includes a link to our PowerPoint script that we uploaded to SlideShare and also our blog. Please support this channel by sharing this video with your friends and by clicking on the like and subscribe buttons and by clicking on the Amazon links to purchase any of the books we discussed, which will earn us a very small affiliate commission. And please consider becoming a patron of our channel. Plus, we will host special discussion groups for our patrons. Plus, you can click on the meetup or small M icon to participate in our online discussions where we practice our future YouTube scripts. And please click on the links for other videos that will broaden your knowledge and improve your soul.